Um, so we're focusing on upper extremity this uh, weekend, and I want to talk to you guys a little bit about imaging for the upper extremity. This is something that I'm very happy to talk about. It gives me great pleasure to talk about imaging because this has really advanced the field of medicine in terms of diagnosing uh, different uh, entities. And then also because of imaging, you don't have to do a physical exam anymore. So <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Of course, the first thing I want to talk about is there's no substitute for the art of the physical exam. So pay attention to what Dr. Luke was talking about in all the small sessions later this afternoon. But imaging is something that can really aid in your uh, diagnosis of various uh, pathologies. So today we're going to talk a little bit about the different modal modalities for imaging. Uh, and then we're going to talk about what to order. And then we're going to talk about how to interpret the reports that you get back from the radiologist. All right, so first of all, let's see here. Why, why do we do imaging? So uh, sometimes it can be because there's a new injury to the patient. So this is a, a patient who had a rotator cuff repair who fell again. And just uh, starting with x-rays, you can see that she had a humeral fracture. And then sometimes there are patients with chronic problems. So if you've tried conservative treatment for a while and nothing's working, then you may want to do some more imaging to find out exactly if there's something else going on. And then most kind of uh, worrisome is you want to rule out any kind of malignant pathology or any kind of tumors, okay? So this is a patient who had chronic wrist pain for a while that didn't get any better. Everyone thought it was arthritis, but then just a simple x-ray showed how much uh, lytic uh, abnormalities there were inside of the distal ulna here, which is consistent with the uh, malignant pathology. And then here, shoulder pain for quite a while, treated conservatively, and then once you get an x-ray, you can see this large blastic lesion um, that's kind of eating away at the bones, also consistent with the malignancy. Now, aim, uh, imaging can help you in diagnosing uh, various pathologies, as I mentioned. You can also determine how significant a path, uh, an abnormality is, and then it can also help us formulate a treatment plan. So here there's some images, patient with uh, elbow pain. This is uh, some, there's some loose bodies uh, in the joint. Um, uh, synovial chondromatosis in the elbow is what this is called, where you form kind of loose bodies that calcify. And then this is something that we can simply remove arthroscopically. And then this is an MRI of that previous slide where there's a blastic lesion in the uh, proximal humerus that's consistent with the uh, tumor. So when you find something like this, then we usually send it to the oncologist or the ortho-oncologist to do a biopsy and further workup. Okay. And then there's basically five main modalities for imaging uh, on the musculoskeletal system. So the first one is plain uh, x-rays or radiographs, which uh, people are, seem to be using less and uh, less these days. So a lot of people are coming into our office with MRIs, CT scans, various things, and they don't even have a normal x-ray. So there, we'll go over that a little bit, but there's a lot of things that you can see on the x-ray that you may not even be able to see on an MRI. And then the ultrasound seems to be um, the craze more recently. You're, you can use ultrasound to diagnose a lot of things, but you can also use ultrasound to localize if you're going to tr try to treat something like even an injection. CT scan, especially in the Bay Area, is probably relatively infrequently used because our uh, patients are very adverse to radiation, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But there are some various pathologies that are very, very uh, 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 important to get CT scans for to help us uh, aid in uh, treatment options. And then bone scans where you actually radio label uh, something in the bloodstream and then um, uh, image that to see exactly what's happening uh, with the metabolic system. That, that can be used for tumors and various other pathologies. And then of course MRI, which is everyone's uh, favorite nowadays, uh, is very good for soft tissue imaging and we'll talk a little bit more about that too. Now. In general, when you're ordering an image, what you want to do is make sure in the spot where it says uh, relevant history, you write down what you're concerned about for the radiologist. So they are very good at looking at everything and they do it systematically, but if you can give them a clue to what you're worried about, it can help them be a lot more accurate and they can really focus on very subtle things that they may 
uh, uh, overlooked sometimes. So if you have, if you're getting X-rays and you're concerned for some kind of a fracture, uh, such as uh, a scaphoid fracture, if they have tenderness in the snuff box on exam, then you should write that down, and then they can really look to see if there's any signs of. Um, uh, a fracture there that may not be very apparent because sometimes these fractures don't show up uh, right away on x-rays. And then um, they can also uh, give you hints on what else to order. So they could say, oh, this, uh, we see something on x-ray that may clue us in on something, but we're not sure if you, if, if you order an MRI, that would be better uh, or more definitive. Uh, and also, if you're doing an MRI for the shoulder, if you're worried about somebody who's dislocating their shoulder, recurrent instability, you want to write something like that versus a rotator cuff tear if they have shoulder pain. So those are things they can focus on for you. All right. And then, again, they can suggest better studies if there's certain ones that, that may be more uh, appropriate for the diagnosis. Now, starting with playing radiographs, uh, you want, these are basically x-ray beams that are shot through and they pr uh, produce high energy electromagnetic kind of uh, uh, changes and they go through the body and then you, they, they're captured on the detector and depending on how thick the, the substance they're shooting it through is, it'll show up as brightness uh, on the detector. So bones are very thick and uh, x-rays don't penetrate the bone as well, so on the detector it shows up as a, a white uh, signal. If the bone is very weak and thin, if you have an osteoporotic patient, the bone is going to be relatively dark because a lot of x-rays are passing through it and there's not as much uh, calcified um, uh, hydroxyapatite to block the, the beams. Okay? So denser objects are brighter on x-ray. And these are a couple of the common ones that we order. So let's start with the shoulder joint. Um, we, you want to order multiple views of any joint. So one view of a joint is usually not enough to tell if the joint is in place, if it's reduced. So especially for the shoulder, if you're worried about a patient that has instability, if the shoulder is unstable or loose or looks like it's hanging low or subluxated, you want to always get more than just one view. So for the shoulder, um, you want to get an AP of the glenohumeral joint. So that's actually um, a little bit different than just an AP of the shoulder. So uh, if you look here, uh, on the left here, this is an AP of the shoulder. Now the, the shoulder is antiverted about 15 degrees, so if you just take an AP of the shoulder, it's, the joint is not going, you're not gonna see the joint right uh, on face, okay? So an AP of the glenohumeral joint looks like this, so you, you actually shoot the x-ray at about 15 degrees uh, outward, and this is called the gray she view, but you, if you just write AP of the glenohumeral joint, uh, they should be able to do that. And then um, the other important thing in the shoulder is uh, the axillary lateral view. So this is the best view for looking at to see if the shoulder is in place, if it's dislocated, if it's subluxated, or if it's actually uh, in the joint. So you can't tell based on just one AP view if the shoulder is actually in or out. Uh, you have to have a combination of this view and then especially the axillary lateral view to make sure it's concentric in the joint and it hasn't popped out the front or the back, okay? So those are the main views uh, in the shoulder. Uh, in the elbow, you wanna get three views typically. So in the elbow, we have uh, an AP view uh, with the elbow straight, a lateral view with the elbow bent at 90 degrees, and then an oblique view for this, okay? So those are the main ones we usually order. So two, uh, three views for the sh uh, elbow. And then for the forearm, it's just relatively straightforward, an AP and a lateral view. So one uh, in the AP plane and then one with it bent at 90 degrees in the lateral plane. And that can show you the whole forearm. And then for the wrist, we usually do three different views. So we have an AP view, a lateral view, and then an oblique for the wrist. So just like the elbow, we have three views uh, for the wrist here to look at the uh, alignment of the carpal bones as well as the distal radius and to make sure there's no fractures in the distal radius joint. All right. And then in the hand, we usually do AP and a lateral of each. So sometimes you can do uh, both hands at the same time to kind of compare if there's any abnormalities side to side for this. Okay. And then what to look for on these views. So when you're doing x-rays of the upper extremity, uh, you want to uh, look for fractures, for one. Anytime you have a displaced fracture where it's actually um, 
angulated and, uh, and displaced. Uh, that's something you wanna, you're worried about. You also wanna look for comminution. So comminution means if there's multiple pieces to the fracture, if it's not just one clean piece, if there's a small piece on the side of it or multiple pieces. So those are all things, if it's displaced and comminuted, those are usually things that need to be operated on. And then impacted would mean that if there's a fracture and it's dug into the other side, um, and then uh, sometimes those are also operative as well. Uh, also on the x-rays, you can very easily see arthritis, and you can see if it's a mild arthritis with a little bit of joint space narrowing versus moderate or severe arthritis where it's bone on bone and there's uh, osteophytes. And then uh, uh, any abnormal uh, morphology of the uh, bones, such as any bone spurs, and OCD we'll talk about a little bit later is an uh, osteochondritis desiccans, where you have a lesion to the cartilage and the subchondral bone. And then, of course, any deformities from ch chronic previous injuries that the patient uh, uh, may not have told you about. So here's an example of severe arth arthritis in the shoulder. So it's bone on bone here. And then there's an osteophyte here, a bone spur below here. Uh, that's a secondary reaction to the arthritis. And then uh, this is an OCD. So uh, Dr. Luke was talking about elbow injuries in uh, especially uh, adolescents. It's very common to have an OCD uh, in the elbow area, especially the uh, pitchers and people that are doing a lot of kind of throwing activities. Uh, this is just a, a lack of blood, blood supply to an area uh, of the subchondral bone, and then that causes that bone to kind of die, and then the cartilage over that surface also becomes unstable. So this, sometimes this can fall off or just cause a lot of pain, and um, depending on how severe it is, sometimes it can be treated with conservative management in a younger patient, such as uh, rest from throwing and various uh, upper extremity activities, but other times if it's pretty severe and loose, you may need to actually do surgery on it. We have a question, yes. Osteochondritis desiccans, yes. All right. And then when to worry, of course, uh, we talked a bit, little bit about this. Displaced fractures always need attention. Non-displaced fractures most of the time can be treated with immobilization. Okay, so those don't necessarily need surgery. Stretched fractures and then things where they said cannot rule out a fracture, those usually need more evaluation. So either close follow-up to see if their cha uh, symptoms change or more imaging to get a better di definitive diagnosis for those. All right, and then uh, moving on from x-rays, you have ultrasound uh, as a way of uh, de detection. So these use ultra high frequency sound waves to produce imaging. Uh, they're kind of like a sonar wave when you uh, try to find treasure at the bottom of the ocean. Um, what you, you can do is use them to evaluate cysts, like ganglion cysts in the wrist. Okay, those are very classically um, evaluated. It's very easy to see fluid uh, from the ultrasound. Okay, so tendon ganglions also. And then in the shoulder, nowadays, people are using this more and more to diagnose rotator cuff tears. So uh, this is a relatively minimally invasive um, modality where you, you could do it uh, in the office just uh, on over the skin, and then you can see uh, for a well-trained technician, whether there is actually discontinuity of the tear. And then uh, after surgery, actually, it's very good for evaluating how well the tendon is healing because if you have implants in there, that can affect the uh, way a post-op MRI would look or a CT scan, but an ultrasound can actually detect the quality of the tendon in the, in the pr uh, presence of any other uh, implants. Uh, so advantages, it's non-invasive, it's dynamic. So you, when you're doing it, you can move the shoulder around or you can move the elbow around to see how that tendon reacts at different planes. So you can actually do this in real time. You, the patient doesn't have to lie still for an hour like they would in an MRI. And then uh, disadvantage is that it is very technician dependent. So if, you have, if you're at a center that does a lot of ultrasounds and the techs are really, really good at doing it, it, it it's very accurate. But if it's a relatively uh, uh, new technician who hasn't done a lot of this, then it, it kind of, it's an, the interpretation can be kind of open based on how well they can see the tissue. And then you can't see uh, tissue inside of bone and you can't see tissue that's too deep and too far away from the surface of the skin. Uh, we do do these a lot now for uh, 
guided treatment. So Dr. Luke does a lot of uh, ultrasound guided injections at UCSF for us. So we, you can use this to find a tendon. So I have an example of when we do it in the hip. So you can uh, use an ultrasound to get it all the way into the hip joint. And then here you can see there, uh, here's the needle and then here's the femoral head. So you, you can kind of get all the way deep into the joint with this injection. And then you can inject cortisone, uh, PRP, various things. Uh, and you can also inject tendons. Sometimes I'll have patients inject the iliopsoas tendon, uh, hip flexor. Uh, and in the shoulder, you can also inject the glenohumeral joint with an ultrasound. So uh, a, a lot of people just do injections uh, for, for the joint in the office, but it's a lot more accurate if you do it under fluoroscopy or with ultrasound, especially if you're doing it for frozen shoulder. I usually like to have my patients do image-guided injections, whether it's with an ultrasound uh, or with radiology with a shot of fluoroscopy to make sure it's actually in the glenohumeral joint. Okay. Good. And then <clears throat> going on from uh, ultrasounds, we have CT scan as the, the next modality. So this creates a tomographic uh, view of the region of interest. So it's kind of it allows us to look at uh, things in different planes and in sections. Okay, and then uh, you can also uh, now reformat the CT scan to give you a 3D bony evaluation. So you can actually see a 3D kind of uh, remodeling of that joint. Uh, it's very good for the shoulder. The the only time we really use it. Uh, or that in my practice for the shoulder is to evaluate uh, chronic instability. Uh, if a patient has a, had a lot of dislocations, sometimes they can start wearing down the bone on the glenoid uh, or the bone on the humeral head, and then using a CT scan will allow us to evaluate that very accurately, more so than even an MRI in, in those instances. If the patient has had a complex reconstruction, some kind of large surgery, uh, having a CT scan can help evaluate how the bone has healed and what kind of uh, deformities they have. And of course, post-traumatic injuries, if the patient had a wrist fracture but it never healed correctly, uh, you may not be able to see the angulation and the malunion on x-ray, but a CT scan allows us to evaluate that much better. Let's see here. So uh, on the other side, though, the disadvantage of a CT scan is it is a lot of radiation. You, it, it does. Uh, it is still subjected to metal artifact. You can have a lot of uh, extra signal if there's a metal implant in. Uh, you can't put a, a large patient in the CT scanner uh, just because it's a 360 degree scanner, just like an MRI, and they may not fit in there. And then uh, one CT scan is equivalent to over 200 X single x-rays. So that's quite a lot of radiation. So you have to think about who you're using these on if you're using it on young, ch young children, especially uh, young female patients, okay? All right, so, so this is a more specific example of uh, shoulder instability that we would uh, benefit from a CT scan for. So this is a chronic dislocator who's dislocated multiple times. On this gray sheet view, the joint looks okay. There's not much arthritis. On the axillary lateral view, you can see that here's the glenoid, and there's something a little abnormal looking there with the glenoid. So if you trace out the shape here, you can see that there's actually a piece of bone missing here. Uh, on the glenoid, but you can't see it very well on just a plain film because of all the other bones in the area. So we got a 3D CT scan, and then you can see that here's the glenoid, and then here's the fracture of the glenoid. So the patient had dislocated so many times that they actually broke off a piece of bone from the glenoid. And this um, changes how we can treat this pathology. So usually uh, in a uh, shoulder instability patient, you can just do an arthroscopic procedure to repair the labrum. However, when you start having bone loss here, then this requires a larger procedure where we need to uh, uh, replace the bone, either transferring a bone from another part of the shoulder or getting a, uh, a bone block uh, from the iliac crest or even a, a donor allograft piece of bone. Uh, so that affects treatment uh, significantly. And then in the, in the wrist, sometimes you can have a, a fracture of the hamate, which is very, very difficult to see on plain films. And then just doing a CT scan will help a lot for, for that, okay? All right, going on to nuclear imaging. So these are uh, relatively uh, infrequently used, but they do offer quite a, a, a significant advantage to some of the other scans. So these are actually where you inject a radio labeled uh, either uh, drug or um, uh, white blood cells uh, for the um, 
uh, bone scan, and then you can use a technetium scanner to basically pick up the radiation uh, that's emitted from these uh, signals that you've injected into the bloodstream. Now, the reason we do this is um, when you have tumors in various places where there's increased biological activity in the body, these uh, radio-labeled um, uh, substances will migrate to those places and be concentrated there. So you can tell if the patient has some kind of a chronic infection, if there's some kind of tumor. So a lot of times we'll use this in our, our malignancy cancer workup because tumor cells have really high metabolic rates and they turn over uh, products much more quickly than your normal cells. So you can use this to highlight uh, tumors. So this is a radio-labeled gluco uh, glucose molecule. And then a PET scan is a, a positron uh, uh, e emission uh, basically uh, scan, and that can pick up this um, uh, radio-labeled substance. Uh, so if the patient has a, a tumor at one place, then you want to do a whole body scan to see if that uh, tumor has metastasized to a different place, then that's when you would use these bone scans for. Okay. Uh, so to rule out uh, tumor, and then again also for uh, infections, you could uh, do a tagged white blood cell scan, and the, if the patient has a chronic infection or osteomyelitis or something where it's not re readily apparent on imaging, uh, using the scan can uh, show us if there's any abnormal things. Now other people have used it in joints as well. Uh, if a joint has arthritis, there is a little bit more metabolic uh, reaction and a little bit more turnover. So these uh, TAG scans and PET scans can, um, can show some early arthritis. And we're actually using them in some research that we're currently doing uh, to see how basically uh, arthritis um, changes your, your metabolic uh, rate for the joints. Okay, so here, uh, here's an example of a bone scan, patient with a chronic shoulder pain for a while. Uh, nothing really showed up in any of the images. And then uh, when we did a, a nuclear bone scan, you can see that the AC joint at the top of the shoulder here is, uh, is very highlighted. So he uh, ended up having a uh, kind of chronic low-grade infection in that area. So it's really relatively rare, but we couldn't really find it on anything else. Okay. And these are a little bit more invasive for patients. You are, you are getting an IV injection. Uh, and then it takes a little bit of time for the uh, scans to show up after you do the imaging. Okay. All right, so finally, we're, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about MRIs. So these are the, currently the gold standard for soft tissue injuries. So rotator cuff tears are readily diagnosed with MRIs, labral tears in the shoulder, uh, ligament tears, and various cartilage injuries. So these are great for looking at this. So uh, the MRI generates a magnetic field, and then it causes hydrogen atoms to spin, and hydrogen atoms in fat versus water spin at different rates. And then when they relax, you can kind of capture uh, how, how fast they relax and they depolarize from the, from the spin. And then that's what produces the images on the MRI. Um, and then if you want to, you can also inject contrast with the MRI, so that can help uh, make things a little bit more specific. One way is to inject contrast into the joint itself, and this can distend the joint. It can show uh, uh, tears in the ligaments or the labrum in the joint and very small injuries in the rotator cuff that normally you can't see uh, without the contrast. Injecting this can help a lot. So you can do this in the shoulder where you inject some, uh, we call it an MR arthrogram, uh, where you inject some gadolinium dye into the shoulder. And that can highlight if there's a very small labral tear that you can see on the, the regular MRI. In the wrist, if there's any ligamentous injuries, the, the uh, injecting the dye can help a lot uh, to really uh, uh, figure those out, okay? And then, so here's one where there's contrast in the shoulder. Uh, you probably do not need it here because it's a relatively large tear, but you can see where the bright contrast is going in through, through the tear and into the subacromial space, so it makes it very easy to see. And then the other way you can inject contrast is intravenously, IV. So this is more to evaluate vascularity of the uh, musculoskeletal tissue. So if there's a tumor, you can uh, use the IV contrast to highlight, uh, give it a little bit more definition because the tumor will, will take up the contrast a little bit more. If you have uh, post-surgical changes, such as scar tissue, you can use IV contrast there to highlight what's scar tissue and what's normal tissue because scar tissue uh, will not take up the contrast. It won't have as much good blood flow to it. 
but sometimes you, you're worried about the effects of the contrast when you give it IV, such as kidney in, insufficiency and any complications from that. Okay, so the MRI uh, most commonly is used to evaluate in the shoulder at least for the rotator cuff injuries. Uh, so what the MRI can tell us how much fatty infiltration there is, how big the tear is and how much the tear has retracted. So we, it's important for us to know how much fat is in the muscle. So we know that with large rotator cuff tears and chronic rotator cuff tears, the muscle cells start turning into fat cells and that affects how we can treat it. If there's too much fat, then even if we are able to repair it, um, it, it's going to fail the repair uh, for most of the time because the tissue just will not heal. Uh, so here's an a, a MRI of the rotator cuff. So this is the supraspinatus tendon, the most commonly injured one. This is a normal one on the right here, where it attaches all the way to the greater uh, tuberosity. And then on the left here, uh, you can see where the tear is, okay? And, and the tendon is completely off from the tuberosity. Uh, and it's no longer attached. So that's a full tear and it's retracted to the, the head of the humerus here. Sometimes they can be retracted all the way back to the glenoid depending on how big and how chronic the tear is. Here's an MRI of the elbow. So here we're evaluating um, that OCD lesion, the osteochondritis desiccans lesion. So this is what it looks like on MRI. So you've got this bright signal here in the subchondral bone because there, there is not good perfusion to that area and then the cartilage in front of it can be displaced. And you can also see that on, on x-ray where there's some lucencies here, okay? And then an MRI in the wrist here, it can uh, commonly be used to evaluate wrist sprains or tears. You should not have any tears in the, the wrist ligaments. That's never a normal thing. So the TFCC is this complex that basically stabilizes the distal ulnar uh, radial joint. Uh, and when, it, when it's torn here, it can cause a lot of chronic wrist pain, especially on the ulnar side for people and various athletes. So an MRI is very good at diagnosing this. And of course, scapegoat fractures. Here's an x-ray. You may see a little bit of a lucency here, but you're not really sure. Uh, but then when you get an MRI, you can really see that there definitely was a fracture and there's all of this bony edema, uh, bone and all of this uh, signal there from the injury. Uh, MR arthrogram, so if we do the arthrogram in the shoulder, it's usually not for rotator cuff tears, it's usually to look more for a labral pathology. So the labrum is a cup of tissue that helps create bumpers and stabilizes the glenohumeral joint. Uh, sometimes it's very hard to see a tear in that on a regular MRI, but if you inject, if you inject contrast into the joint, then that can actually show you uh, where, uh, where the tear is as the contrast will kind of seep through that area. And in the elbow, just like what Dr. Luke talked about earlier in terms of Tommy John surgeries and ulnar collateral uh, ligament injuries, if you inject some contrast in the shoulder, it can highlight very easily if there's a tear in the ulnar collateral or uh, ligament, also called the medial collateral ligament of the elbow. So you can see the contrast here uh, seeping out on this side. And then this is a normal uh, MCL there where the contrast stays within the joint. And in the wrist, of course, also you can use this to help with the uh, various uh, ligaments in the wrist, such as the TFCC, which uh, if you can see it on a regular MRI, that's, um, that's very good. But a lot of times you'll need the contrast to really highlight the wrist injuries because the ligaments are so small and the, the space between the carpal bones is so small. Okay, so the last part here is you've got, you've ordered your, you've figured out what's wrong, you've ordered your MRI, and then the radiologist gives you a report with a bazillion uh, words on it. How do you interpret, interpret this? So a few things for us to know. Uh, MRIs of the shoulder will pick up a lot of things that may or may not actually be pathologic or it may or may not actually be causing the pain in the patients. So in the asymptomatic individual, individual, we've done a lot of studies looking at this. If you're over 60 years old, there's over a 50% chance that you have a tear in your rotator cuff, even if you have no pain or problems with it. Okay, and 28% of these are actually full thickness tears if you were to just MRI asymptomatic patients, and then 26% of those are partial tears. So if you're over 60 years old, having a rotator cuff tear may not actually be uh, the main cause of your pain, okay? That could just be a normal finding in the asymptomatic in individual. However, if you're a little bit younger, if you're between the ages of 40 and 60, uh, only 4% of those asymptomatic people will have a rotator cuff tear. So that means that 
if you have a full rotator cuff tear and you're between age 40 to 60, that's usually an abnormal thing. That's usually some kind of injury involved. And if you're even younger in the 19 to 39 age group, you should never see a full thickness tear. Those patients' rotator cuffs, tear, uh, rotator cuffs should be pristine. Okay, so if you see something uh, in the younger age group, that's usually, it usually means that's an abnormal injury. But in the older patient, that could just be wear and tear through the years, a little bit of no, uh, normal degeneration, and it's not necessarily abnormal. So you have to be careful with your interpretation. So if a patient gets an MRI and they have these findings, you have to kind of still rely on your physical exam to see if it fits with what you think the diagnosis is. Okay. When you do an MRI and it shows a rotator cuff tear, a lot of times it can tell us how many tendons are involved. There is four rotator cuff tendons. Sometimes it's one out of the four. Sometimes it's three out of the four. Uh, if there's any retraction, so how far back the, the tendon has retracted, if there's any fat involvement, and then also if there's any denervation. So sometimes you can see that uh, um, uh, as a sign of a, a chronic rotator cuff injury. Uh, and when you're interpreting these films, you want to keep in mind the age of the patient. Uh, and the most important thing is that older patients uh, are, are very commonly, commonly have partial rotator cuff tears that can be treated well with conservative management. So in the study uh, that we did, 70% of patients after rotator cuff tear can get better with physical therapy. Okay, so keep that in mind. And then, however, full thickness tears in a young patient uh, that's usually something that needs to be operated on. That's not something that, that's normal. And then uh, labral tears. So uh, if there is a labral tear on the MRI and it's a young patient who has dislocated their shoulder, that's abnormal. So this is a, an MR arthrogram where we inject the contrast and the labrum here is separated off. And this is something that causes uh, instability if they've torn that labrum. However, in an older patient, degenerative labral tears are very normal findings. So that's very normal for age, especially if the patient has never dislocated their shoulder and you have an MRI that shows a labral tear, there's nothing to worry about for the, that patient who's over 60 years old. And then along those same lines, a superior labral tear uh, is something that you can have with overhead activity in the young patient. So people that play volleyball, basketball, do a lot of things overhead, they could tear the superior part of their labrum. Uh, we also call it a slap tear. And that can usually cause pain in the younger patient. But if you, if you see that kind of uh, finding in an older patient, there's nothing to worry about for that. That's very normal for them. Okay. And then, of course, uh, labral tears do not cause weakness. If the patient has weakness on the exam, it's usually the rotator cuff that, that's injured. Okay. And then I want to talk about AC joints. So it's very commonly found that there's a lot of signal on, in the AC joint on MRI. This is something that is a, that's a clinical diagnosis. It's a very superficial joint. You can just push on the top of their shoulder. If it doesn't hurt and you see all the signal on the MRI, that's just an incidental finding. Uh, because for whatever reason, that joint really becomes highlighted with the MRI. But a lot of times, people have no problems, no findings from, from something like this. Okay. And then, uh, of course, elbow we talked about. Um, and you can find loose bodies or OCDs in there, as well as the ligament tears. And then uh, in the wrist as well. Okay, so coming down here, we know that radiologists, uh, they love to use adjectives in their reports. So they'll give you lots and lots of things uh, to, to talk about. And it's your job to kind of uh, decide what to, um, um, what's important. And then they'll add clinical correlation recommended. Okay, so that, of course, that's the most important part. Uh, but let's go through a couple of these things that we've seen in our patients. Okay, so here's one. <laughs> A uh, 55-year-old with uh, posterior pain for one, sh one year, he never had any trauma. So the, pa uh, the radiologists tell us that there is adequate distension. We, they, we gave him some contrast. There's some mild osteoarthritis, uh, mild tendinosis. So all of this, most of the time I don't even read this. I go to the, the very end here and at the impression, okay? And then even this impression is not that helpful. So these are their main findings. Irregularity at the anterior superior labrum compatible with degenerative changes. This is a 55 year old who didn't have trauma to keep in mind. Blunting of the anterior labrum without discrete tear. Posterior labrum appears intact. And then they talk about the rotator cuff. Mild tendinosis of the supraspinatus tendon and anterior fibers of the infra 
and possible limited tearing of the posterior fibers. Uh, okay, so what, what's this report say? Uh, nothing. So everything is pretty much normal for this guy, 55-year-old without trauma. Okay, so you have to keep in mind what's normal and what's abnormal, uh, and, and that'll help you kind of interpret these, okay? Here's another one, a 65-year-old with shoulder pain, and we said, just evaluate the shoulder for us, please. And then this is what they found in the impression. So no, no evidence of fracture, mild degenerative changes, uh, close approximation suggesting rotator cuff pathology. Um, okay, and then um, ossified fragments. So this is, uh, sorry, this is an x-ray, and the, this is <laughs> what they gave us from, from the x-ray. And all that shows is it's normal findings in terms of an x-ray, but there's a little bit of a hooked acromion, which may be uh, uh, basically um, a risk factor for subacromial impingement. Uh, however, they did find that there are pulmonary nodules, so this depends on the history. If the patient has had any history, uh, they may need further evaluation for this, okay? Um, and then here's one 51-year-old with uh, right shoulder pain after a fall. And then we gave him a pretty good history here. We're worried he fell, and then he, on exam, he couldn't uh, lift his arm very well. So we said, please rule out a full thickness rotator cuff tear. So here, the impression at the bottom, uh, full thickness tear at the anterior footprint of the supraspinatus with tendinosis, and then thickening of the glenohumeral ligament synovitis. So, okay, so the adhesive capsulitis part, that doesn't really help us, but they found that there was a full thickness tear, and in someone who's 51, after an acute trauma, this is something that needs to be retreated, uh, that needs to be treated. And usually, uh, for patients like this, after an acute injury, it's better to fix this sooner rather than later. So, so that's, that was a helpful report for that part. And then um, here, a 40-year-old with elbow pain and a biceps, uh, we're worried a little bit about him rupturing the biceps. Okay, and then uh, these are all their findings, and then we go to the end here. Uh, this impression is very good, actually. An acute tear of the biceps at its insertion and a retraction of five centimeters, okay? So that tells us this is an acute tear and that it's kind of pulled back, so we need to get this back to where it needs to be. And then the common extensor is frayed and irregular, so this is an old injury, okay? So this is actually very good. It identified the acute injuries, it downplayed the chronic injuries, and it also summarized uh, the important uh, parts in the impression. So in summary, uh, upper extremity imaging, you want to make sure you give a good history to uh, the radiologist when you're ordering them, and they can help answer your questions a little bit more directly. Uh, start with the playing uh, radiograph, okay? Don't go straight to an MRI for, for everything. There's a lot of things that can be picked up on an x-ray first, and a lot of things that can be ruled out on an x-ray first. And then for ac acute injuries, you want to try to image those a little bit quicker, especially when the examination is very hard because the patient has a lot of pain. Pain. And then chronic injuries, you may be able to delay a little bit and start conservative therapy before uh, imaging too much, but also make sure you know how to interpret the results and what's important and what's not important. And then, of course, if they had a surgery and they had some kind of injury right after that, that's important to make sure they come back to us uh, and for us to kind of manage that. All right, if there's any questions, please feel free to call or email uh, me or any of us at any point. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you.